friends, welcome back to my channel. I hope you are well. If you're new here, hi, my name is Becky. I've had type 1 diabetes for 17 years and this channel is a space where I create videos all about diabetes, living with diabetes and tips and strategies that I implement into my diabetes management. And a big, big part of my life as a type 1 diabetic is exercise and specifically weight training. Um, so I did a video, I feel it must have been over a year ago now, all about managing your blood sugars around different types of exercise. But this was, was, was with a really heavy focus on managing your blood sugars with multiple daily injections because that's what I was on at the time. And now that I've got an insulin pump, I found there's actually a lot, a, like a really big difference between managing my blood sugars around exercise on MDI versus now on an insulin pump. I thought I should do a new video all about managing your blood sugars around exercise but using an insulin pump. So here we are. I'm gonna start with a little bit of a recap about how different types of exercise might um, affect your blood sugars. This was in the last video, but if you haven't seen that, I'll just do a brief recap here. And then we'll talk about the strategies and mechanisms that I use for exercising with an insulin pump. The first thing we need to address is the assumption that any form of exercise will cause a reduction in your blood sugar, because obviously you're using through energy to do that exercise, and so your blood sugar must be going down. However, Certain types of exercise can produce hormones like adrenaline and cortisol as a stress response. And this stress response can cause a spike in your blood sugar, which as a side note is why if you're in a stressful situation, you might often find that your blood sugar goes up because of that stress response. But like I just said, that response can also be caused by some types of exercise. Now the types of exercise that elicit a stress response will differ from person to person. So for this whole video, none of this is a cookie cutter approach. It isn't one size fits all. I'm just gonna be talking to you about the mechanisms and the strategies that you can use and you can see it where to implement them into your own diabetes management based on your own body and your own analysis of your own blood sugars, which is really, really crucial. But some common um, types of exercise that might elicit this stress response are HIT, so high intensity interval training, whether that's through circuit training or through sprints on a treadmill or on a bike or any form of sprints like that. Um, also weight training, but specifically strength training and high weight, low rep strength training. Uh, but like I said, it can differ from person to person. I actually find I get the biggest stress response these days from running, just plain running. And a lot of people find steady state cardio is the, the least likely to cause that spike because there's no kind of big push of effort. Um, but for me, I find running so difficult. I get a huge blood sugar spike um, from just straight running um, because of that stress response. So again, it's analyzing how your body responds to the exercise working out why that is based on the science and then implementing a strategy to help that become a flatter graph. But on the flip side of that stress response, we do have the blood sugar reaction that most people expect from exercise, which is obviously a reduction in your blood sugar caused by your muscles using up that available glucose um, to fuel the exercise. This is really common, like I just said, for steady state cardio, also for things like a lower intensity weight training session when you're doing perhaps lighter weight, higher reps, things where you're not causing a huge, huge impact um, in that moment, um, but you're working your muscles. Um, you can also get this same reduction in blood sugar in the same form of exercise where you might get that initial blood sugar spike from the stress response, but as your body starts to get into the exercise and the stress response reduces and your muscles start to use up that glucose, um, you see more of a balance and your blood sugar later on in those sessions that might cause an initial blood sugar spike might then start to reduce as the stress response diminishes depending on how your session flows. So it's not necessarily like one exercise type of exercise of this, and one does this, it might be that you have both effects mixed in to the same form of exercise and it's just about working out when each response occurs for you within your different types of training. So if you want to avoid those highs and lows around exercise, you're going to have to think about your insulin strategy and your food strategy around training. If you've seen any of my vlogs, you'll know that I adjust my plan each time depending on the situation um, and I explain all of my thought processes in each situation so that you know how I've come to the conclusion of what I'm going to do around exercise but there's always that key basic principles that 
found all of those decisions. And you wanna think about before your workout, during your workout and after your workout. Now we've spoken a bit about exercise and diabetes as a whole, it's time to jump into the pump portion of this video. Um, so one thing you might find just straight off the bat if you come from MDI to an insulin pump is that if you've found those areas where you might have a stress response normally, um, you might not have that as markedly on a pump. So I personally, when I was on MD MDI, used to have a huge stress response from HIIT training. It would send me right up. Um, now I'm on a pump, I don't really have a stress response at all. And that's because of the different types of insulins that you have going on. Obviously when you're on MDI, you have a flat profile for your basal. You take it in the morning and you take it in the evening, or perhaps you just take it once a day, depending on what type of basal insulin you're on. So you have a flat profile. Whereas with your pump, you have a steady drip feed of fast acting insulin, which is working as your basal insulin, but because it's fast acting insulin, it is constantly working against those stress hormones that are perhaps being released during your exercise. And you might find that you act that, that insulin acts a lot more effectively against that kind of spiking response because it is fast acting insulin being constantly drip fed into you and not a flat profile basal insulin. So I find regardless of stress response or no stress response, exercising on the insulin pump, I need a lot less insulin full stop. But especially around those ones where I had a really marked stress response, um, I definitely don't see that as much on the pump. And this is where temporary basals come in. I love temporary basals on the insulin pump. If you don't know what they are, it's where you can reduce your normal basal insulin amount, which is that drip fed fast acting insulin by a certain percentage. And I implement them several times a day, but I almost always implement them for exercise. And you can use them before, during and after your exercise, depending on what is right for you. And I'm gonna give you now a bit of an example as to how I use temporary basal rates. So normally for any form of exercise, I go first thing in the morning as soon as I wake up. If I wake up with a blood sugar below five, I then put on a 0% temporary basal rate. Um, this is because I know that that fast acting insulin is going to drop me really quickly. I also have a 15 to 20 minute walk to the gym before I even start the exercise. I do have a snack before I go, which I'm gonna come on to in a second, um, which will obviously help uh, increase my blood sugar to prevent a hypo. Um, but I know that starting below five, and with the walk to the gym and the effects of the actual exercise themselves, um, I will go low very quickly. So I do not want to be having any insulin pumping through me at that point. So I put on a 0% temporary basal. I then keep a very close eye on my blood sugars. And the minute I get back up to about seven, depending on what kind of session it is, again, I have to take that into account and I'm gonna talk about that later. But when I hit about seven, that is when I will turn that temporary basal rate off and I'll have my basal going back to normal again. Um, this is because obviously you don't want to then spike from having no insulin on board, um, but you don't want to turn that temporary basal off too early, have insulin going through your body again um, too soon before you're high enough and then you might end up just going hypo. As I just mentioned, I also have a snack before I go. Every single day I have a banana before the gym. Again, I need less of a bolus on the pump for my pre-workout snack than I ever did on MDI. So on MDI, I was having anywhere between one and a half normally to two units of insulin um, for that banana, depending on the type of session I was gonna be doing. Um, now on the pump, I need anywhere between half a unit to one unit, as well as a potential 0% temporary basal. Again, depending on the type of session I'm doing and depending what my starting blood sugars are. If you do use temporary basals like that and you have a 0% temporary basal, it's really important to consider not only your starting blood sugar, but also the type of session you're going to be doing. So for example, in that instance, say if I woke up with my blood sugar is four. Typically, I would then put on a temporary basal so that I don't drop and go low. However, if I do that and I have burnt banana, if I'm four, I probably won't have any bolus for that banana at all. So at this point, I'm at the gym, I've got a banana on board, no insulin to cover that banana, and I've also got no basal going on. Depending on what kind of session it is, I will then need to tailor my plan moving forwards accordingly because I don't want to have insulin earlier than this because I will then go hypo before my session, but I also don't want to be going high during my session. And if I had that strategy and I didn't have any insulin at any point during the session for say a um, heavy squat session, which would elicit some form of stress response, 
I will spike very high very quickly. Um, so then I know that although I want no insulin for that banana and I want a temporary basal for the whole walk to the gym, I'll probably then do my warm up sets for the squats with no insulin on board still. And when I start getting into my working sets, that's when I'll put my basal back on um, because I know that that's when I'm going to start getting a stress response. I want to have some insulin in my body to negate that because stress response plus carbs um, plus no insulin is going to be a very high blood sugar. Whereas if that is the situation before, um, say, a sprint session, which for me doesn't really elicit much of a stress response anymore because I'm burning through the glucose so quickly um for example this morning i had no bolus i had a temporary basal um, and i went straight into my sprints and i didn't need any insulin until quite far into the session when i took just half a unit to cover all of that so it's about working out not just the doses but also the timings for each session is really really important if you do not quite hit those timings exactly as you'd like and you do end up going a little bit high it's likely then that you have turned off your temporary basal rate but if you shoot up really quickly you might also want a correction or equally for some sessions i it's not a correction that i'm having it's just the bolus that i would have to cover that banana in the morning but i have it later in the session because of that walk and all of the stuff i mentioned before so it's not just the doses it's the timing but if you do get to the point where you want a correction it's really important to consider the fact that that correction is likely going to be a lot smaller than a correction you would usually do. If I'm correcting at the gym, I'm doing half to a third of the correction that I would usually do for the same um, gap in my blood sugar because your insulin is going to be used a lot more effectively while you're exercising. And also it completely can also depend on where your pump site is. If I've got my pump site going into my leg and I'm doing a lower body session, that insulin is going directly into a near a very big muscle that is being worked to its maximum. That insulin is going to be used like that. It's going to be used very, very efficiently and effectively, and that will cause a much quicker and a much more drastic drop in my blood sugar than it would if I was just sitting around. So you really wanna think when you're doing a correction, especially on the pump when all of your insulin is, insulin is fast acting insulin, um, you wanna think carefully about just how much of a correction factor you want to use. I've mentioned a lot of different if this and if that and various situations and techniques you can use. But the important thing to say is that these are only gonna work if you keep a really close eye on, on your blood sugars throughout your sessions. I check my Libra between every new exercise that I do, just because that's quite a good time interval for me. You might wanna do every 10 minutes, every 15 minutes, whatever works for you. Also, there might be times where you don't wanna check it as often and that's fine, but if you're like near a high or near a low, that's when you wanna be kick, uh, keeping a much closer eye on things. And the amazing thing about a pump is that you can act super quickly and you can also undo a lot of things. If, say you put on a temporary basal, you start to rise, you turn that temporary basal off, uh, so you have your basal going as normal again. Say 15 minutes later, you're dropping really low, you can just put another temporary basal back on again because you know maybe you took off the temporary basal too soon. There's a lot of things that you can adapt really quickly with a pump that you can't do on injection. So that's the actual session covered, but it's also really important to think about that post-workout section and that post-workout meal because if you've done especially something like weight training it's likely that your insulin sensitivity will increase potentially quite dramatically and also for quite a long period of time you might even see increased insulin sensitivity for the next 12 to 24 hours depending on how new you are to weight training and how intense your session was if you did something like steady state cardio your insulin sensitivity isn't going to be increased for as long but you might still see a bit of increased sensitivity after your session so again it's seeing about how that session affects you during immediately after and through the next day so that you can understand how to manipulate your insulin strategy as a caveat to that it's important to also consider what type of session you've done so that you can see how your insulin sen sensitivity is going to be affected moving forwards but also what was your insulin strategy during that session and how is that going to affect you moving forwards for example if you've had a zero percent 10 basal on for perhaps one to two hours before and during your session 
you've then had no insulin on board for quite a significant period of time. And if you then go in with a post-workout meal, you might see a significant blood sugar spike if you just did your usual insulin. So for me, after a leg day, I tend to reduce my bolus quite a lot um, because of that increased insulin sensitivity. However, if I've woken up on the lower side and I've had a temporary basal on, um, from the minute that I wake up until when I get home, because say on that session, I never ended up putting my basal back on because I stayed um, low within my range, that's two hours with no insulin on board. If I then went and did my usual post leg day reduced bolus for my breakfast, I am gonna skyrocket because I've had no insulin on board for a long time. I've just introduced carbs into my system again um, with what would then be not enough insulin to cover that meal. So I know that if I've had a long temporary basal on, I don't need to reduce my post workout bolus by as much. Equally, after leg day, I have a very small pre-bolus window, normally about five minutes, depending on where my blood sugar's at. If I'm low by the time I get to my post-workout meal, I will even in inject as I'm eating or just before I start to eat. So I don't really have much of a pre-bolus. However, if I have had a long temporary basal with no insulin on board for up to two hours, I will then have a longer pre-bolus. I'll take my insulin 10 maybe even 15 minutes before eating because i want to make sure that i have insulin going through my system ready to tackle those carbs before the carbs hit my system even if i'm at the lower end of my range i will still do that long pre-bolus um, because i don't want to have a massive rebound spike from not having um, any basal on board. So essentially, when you are calculating a post-workout bolus dose, you want to consider your blood sugar at the point that you're doing that. You want to consider how your blood sugars were trending throughout your session. You want to consider, obviously, the carbs, what is the carb count and um, the macros in your meal. You want to consider what type of session were you doing. Uh, and you also want to consider if you had a temporary basal on board, what percentage of a temporary basal was it? And how long was that temporary basal active for? How long were you not getting any insulin for or not getting the same amount of insulin as usual for? As well as any bolus doses that you took during your session. So I hope that gives you an overview as to my new approach to exercise now that I'm on an insulin pump. A few things that you might find different training on MDI versus training on an insulin pump and a few strategies and mechanisms to consider when you're working out your personal insulin strategy around exercise. I think the main things to note with the pump versus MDI is that you might be less likely to experience a blood sugar spike from stress. Um, it's likely that any corrections that you take will uh, bring you down a lot faster and potentially a lot more than they would potentially on MDI. You're likely to also run a bit lower throughout your session on the pump and you may need to reduce pre-workout pre boluses. And you can obviously, of course, always make use of temporary basal rates that you can't do on MDI. It's a lot more convenient to manipulate your insulin on the pump um, during a training session because obviously you have it attached to you all, all the time. If you do need to take a correction, you can just plug it into your pump and you don't have to inject on the gym floor, which can be intimidating. Um, and they, you can overall just be a bit more reactive to whatever your blood sugars are doing. Yeah, that is it for this chat all about exercising on an insulin pump. Please leave any tips down below if you also have some insight into this, some things I didn't mention. Obviously, insulin pumps, exercising, diabetes is a huge topic. We couldn't possibly cover everything in one video. Um, but any insight you have, please do share it down below. Have a great rest of your day and I will see you soon. Bye.